It was a great presentation. Thank you. Let's move forward because we are moving right now from company field to academic field. I'm introducing Michal Sojka, who works at Czech Technical University in Prague. Need to admit, this topic is really, really difficult even for me to pronounce and to, to read. So he will introduce himself. Just in a nutshell, it's going to be about demand for high performance computing and the safety requirements, avoiding the platforms overheating, and much, much more. This seems to be a robust project. And the question I have for you is, what are your partners? Because I'm sure you need a lot of partners in order to make it realized. So if you can name some of those partners and elaborate further. Over to you. Yeah, thank yeah. you very much. Yeah, so thank you. Uh, of course, uh, this, this work has been done with few partners, not that much. But the main partner was uh, Honeywell company who produces aerospace, aerospace components. So this, the topic actually was from them. And uh, another partner was also Portuguese uni university in, in Porto, but uh, with that university, we uh, worked together on slightly different topics. So this is mainly uh, between us and the company. Thank you. So uh, my, my work is uh, called uh, Software-Based Methods for Peak Temperature Reduction of Modern Multi-Core multi Chips in Safety Critical Applications. Yeah, so it's uh, it's complex title. So let's look uh, in more in detail what it is actually about. So uh, multiprocessor systems on chip. Uh, those are typical chips used today in modern embedded applications, autonomous driving, uh, drones, and, and these things. You can see such a chip uh, here in this picture. Uh, it's actually the whole computer in a single chip. Besides that single chip, you need just a few more chips like uh, memory, uh, some power, power controllers, and that's it. You have the whole computer. And such chips are used in many applications. They are used not that much in avionics because avionics is very conservative, uh, especially due to safety reasons. Uh, and using highly complex chips in avionics uh, in safety applications uh, has some problems. But nevertheless, even avionics looks forward and tries to prepare for, for the future where those chips will be a part of, of avionics. And one of the problems they have, at least what they told us, is that the cheap uh, chips have to meet strict thermal envelope, meaning that the chip temperature should be held below certain threshold. And there are multiple ways how this can be achieved. For example, you mount a fence uh, on top of the chip, but having a mechanical component in an airplane is not good because fans are not uh, highly reliable and relying on the fan is simply not good enough. Similarly, you can have massive heat sink, but massive heat sink, uh, it, uh, it has some weight, and the weight is something that they don't like in the airplanes. Uh, so there is another, another approach, and this is like purely software-based methods, how you, can, how you can decrease the temperature. And this is exactly what we have been looking at. Uh, finally, in the end, I think all these methods will be combined together, but if every method is able to decrease the temperature by a few degrees, that's, uh, that's our goal. So uh, let's look how we proceed with this uh, with these settings. First, we have developed a test bed where we can measure measure the temperatures, power consumption, and so on. Uh, and we analyzed uh, on this test bed how the chip itself behaves and how the applications that uh, we are using how they behave from the thermal and power consumption point of view. Then we have created a mathematical model. Uh, based on that model, we perform some kind of optimizations. And finally, we validated that what 
comes out of the optimization really works in reality on, on the physical platform. Mm -hmm. So this is mainly the outline of the presentation. And now <clears throat> let's look at how we build the test bed and what we can do with the test bed. We have actually built multiple test beds. So this is, this is just the first one, but uh, as you will see, all those test beds share some components. So the structure is uh, basically the same. So the core of the test bed, if of, of course the embedded system with multi-core systems on chip, it's uh, NXP i.mx8 uh, uh, CPU. Uh, and this is, this is the target board. This is what we are interested in where we run our workloads. Besides that, we have an uh, ambient temperature sensor uh, because we need to take it into account when doing experiment. We can measure the power consumption of the whole board. We can control the fan. This is used mainly for cooling in the middle of the experiments because we said that we don't want to have any fans, but for just for experiments, that's what we have here. Uh, we can control the board remotely, like switching uh, on and off and resetting and all, all these things. And finally, all of this is controlled by another board, uh, something like Raspberry Pi, but uh, different, uh, different one. Uh, those are the main components. And besides that, we also had a thermal camera. So now I am going to show how our thermal camera looks like. This is another another uh, another board that we had in our test bed, but you can see that the thermal camera looks directly uh, at the chip, and we have painted the chip with black color so that uh, the thermal emissivity is higher and the thermal camera can better see the temperature in different parts of the of the chip. You can also see that we we no longer have a fan here. So we can directly observe the temperature uh, on the chip. And this, this gray thing is, uh, is just a tube which can flow the air to cool down, uh, to cool down the CPU to prevent, prevent overheating during our experiments. So <clears throat> that's, that's our test bed. Now let's see what the thermal camera can see on, on this board. Uh, the thermal camera see exactly what you see on the left figure. Uh, you can see that now the, the CPU temperature is about 43 degrees Celsius. Uh, and if you look directly on the chip itself, which is this uh, red rectangle, the detail of that uh, figure is here. So you can see that the chip is more hot uh, at the, let's say, top right part of the figure and cold at the bottom left. But it has to be said that the temperature difference here is only 1.6 uh, degrees Celsius. So it's not very much. Uh, we don't see much details in this figure. Therefore, on top on this figure, we perform some image processing uh, to, let's say, reverse thermal, uh, thermal equation, how the, how the uh, thermal uh, how the heat is propagating through the chip. And based on that equation, uh, we can figure out where on the chip is heat generated. So you can see clearly that there is one heat source on the chip and there is another smaller one and yet another smaller one. So this, uh, uh, this part is somewhere here. This part is somewhere here. So now next, what we were interested in, like what, what are those places where the, where the heat is generated uh, so that we can, we can use it later. Uh, to, uh, to understand that, it ne it's necessary to look at what actually is inside the chip. So here is a simplified like uh, drawing of, of what is there. The most important parts from the temperature point of view are the CPU. So there are two CPU uh, clusters. Here we have four ARM Cortex-A53 CPUs. These are smaller, slower, but more energy efficient CPUs. And the other uh, CPU cluster, there are two A72 uh, CPUs. These are faster, but uh, they are more energy hungry. Uh, besides that, there are two GPUs or two accelerators, either a graphical accelerator or video accelerator and display processor. 
And uh, what, what is um, also important from energy point of view is the memory controller. The rest are a lot of other peripherals, but they are not really important for uh, performance uh, for power consumption. So now we have thermal camera, we know what's in the chip. So let's look uh, what the thermal camera see in real time. And we have developed a tool which allows us to process the images and see what's happening there in real time. And what you see here is when we execute a workload and one second we execute on one A53 CPU, another second we execute on A77. So you can see on this picture, uh, uh, second from the right, this is this is where the heat sources are best visible. You can really see that every second the, the uh, the heat source switches from one part of the chip uh, to another part of the chip. So with this, uh, you can you can somehow get an uh, idea what is in which part of the chip and how the heat propagates through the chip. You can do a lot of interesting analysis from that. So just as a side note, this is a this is like a a lot of experiments where we change the change the temperature of the of the chip and look at whether uh, depending on the temperature whether uh, the heat sources change somehow or not and as you can see the heat sources are almost always at the same time uh, at the same place so <clears throat> let's let's get back to the chip layout we performed a lot of experiments and uh, with those experiments we wanted to see like where are different parts of the chip and how they can interact with each other from thermal point of view. So on the left figure you can see with different colors when we executed workload on different parts of the chip where these were. So A53 CPUs, these are those slower energy efficient ones are located here. A72 CPUs are located here, and the GPUs are located at the top. It's clearly visible that those more powerful A70 CPUs can be easily distinguished from each other. There is one, there is second one. But if we wanted to distinguish those uh, more energy efficient A53 CPUs, which are somewhere here in the left, we can see that the CPUs are really small and we cannot really distinguish where the heat um, is produced by them because there is this is gray there is no no shade of any color similarly we can see like where the two gpus are located on the chip we can also see different parts of the memory hierarchy and how uh, uh, which parts of the chip responds to changing of the of the chip frequency so this is all the information that we can get from thermal camera and you will see later we use it to some extent in our analysis. But before I start talking about our analysis, I will show another video, another testbed that we have built. Now, this is not an embedded system. We wanted to see what happens when you take a desktop, uh, desktop CPU and look at it with thermal camera. So what you can see, this is the desktop, uh, desktop CPU. Uh, without any lid, uh, this black rectangle that you see in the middle, this is directly the silicon. It's only painted, painted with black color again, so that the thermal camera can better sense the temperature. And so uh, what you can see on, on this CPU, uh, again, we have here the video from thermal camera. Now the, the CPU is idle, nothing is executing on it. But when we execute a workload, each second, there is something executed on a different CPU. On the figures below, you clearly see uh, how the, the heat is uh, generated at different parts of the of the chip. So this way, we can we can see uh, where the CPUs are located, and we can use this information to optimize the uh, temperature layout of the chip, and so on. So and that's uh, that's all about our test bed. And now let's look at how we can use this information and other information that we have to optimize the workload and to really decrease uh, decrease the temperature. So first, we want to decrease the temperature, but 
as you might have seen, the temperature measuring the temperature is it's not easy because the temperature is influenced by ambient temperature. There is a lot of noise. The resolution of the temperature sensors on the chip is not very good. Uh, it's more precise and better to measure power consumption. So here you can see the results of the experiments where we compared the dependency of the final chip temperature with respect to total power consumption. And what can be seen is that it's pretty linear dependency. The more power you take, uh, the, the higher the temperature of the chip is. So that's, that's just a confirmation that, that physics, um, physics works as it should work. And uh, thanks to that, uh, in our optimization, we don't really need to measure the temperature. It's sufficient to measure the power, uh, and therefore it can be more efficient and faster to get all the values that we need for our optimization. So what are the values? Uh, in order to optimize something, we have to know our workload. In our case, we, we had a few different benchmarks. You can see those benchmarks listed here below the graph. Those are different programs that we, we want to run on the chip in the final application. And we need to know something about them in advance. And we settled uh, on describing each type of application with just two numbers. It turns out that this is sufficient and this is the best. We, we tried even something more elaborate, but this simple model worked very well. And uh, this, uh, this model for each benchmark, we just need to know two parameters, O offset and A. O means how much is the power consumption increased when you run this application on otherwise idle CPU. And this activity coefficients, this A number, it means how, uh, how the power consumption increases if you run one additional, uh, one additional application on another CPU. So you are actually running two applications uh, together, let's say. So, and you can see that those numbers are different uh, for, the, uh, for different programs, depending on the program. Uh, some are more power hungry, let's say some are less power hungry. That's, that's how it is. So this is our power model. Next, we need to understand uh, performance model because of course, if you run your, uh, your program on the uh, slower energy efficient CPU, it takes more time to execute it. If you run it on the faster, it's faster. So uh, we benchmark our programs. These are again, simple numbers. How long does certain computation work? And you can see the ratio between the slower and energy efficient CPU and faster and energy less efficient CPU. Uh, some workload is three and a half faster when running on the faster CPU uh, for different workloads is just one point something. So that's the trade-off. You have to decide whether you want fast execution or more energy efficient. And that's what we will use in our optimization later. Uh, ne next thing that we need to do to, to know to perform the optimization is how, uh, how the applications will be executed. In avionics, it's slightly different than in the other industries. They are very strict. They execute their workload uh, based on static time partition schedule, which means that everything is given in advance. There is a certain uh, cycle and execution of those applications, tasks, or partitions, if you want, just repeats periodically. Uh, and the schedule, how the applications execute, is always the same. Uh, so uh, the schedule. Uh, it's called major frame, which repeats forever. This major frame is split into windows and it, in each windows you can have certain applications. They are called partitions or tasks and they can run on different, uh, different CPUs. And our goal is basically to find the schedule, uh, how to, where to run the application in which window and on which CPU and by changing these things wisely, we want to decrease, decrease the temperature. So how we do it, we, uh, we have an integer linear program, which is a method for mathematical optimization. This is our model. I will not go into details. What's important is that here you see those, uh, those 
parameters that I have talked about before, like this activity coefficients, execution time coefficients, or this offset coefficients. So this is the input of our model. We also specify what is our target period uh, of the schedule, the repetition. We solve the model and the output is uh, how many scheduling windows we need to have and where to put each, uh, each task. So <clears throat> that's it. Uh, now let's look at the result, how, how well our method works and whether it can really save some, some temperature. Uh, here you can see the schedules. Uh, the, this is the result of our optimization. And our method is, is here at the top left uh, figure. Uh, those rectangles of different color colors are those different benchmarks that we have benchmarked before. And here we see the final temperature, which is measured on the real hardware when this workload is executed. To compare ourselves with something else, and we, we try different allocation strategies, different methods, how to, uh, how to produce the schedule. So for example, this, this method tries to uh, make uh, the lowest utilization, meaning we want to have as much uh, space here white and the result is that this method puts basically almost everything to those fast, uh, fast CPUs, which are more or less energy efficient. And this can clearly uh, be visible on the final temperature. So here, this, uh, this method is 14% worse temperature-wise than our method. If we do not compare our temperature based on the idle temperature in the room, but if we compare, uh, sorry, ambient temperature in the room, but if we take as a baseline the idle temperature of the board when the board is not loaded at all, uh, this is 27% worse than, than our method. So maybe it's not that likely that people, uh, people will use like, we will execute everything on the on this high power uh, CPU. Maybe they use some kind of mix. Uh, so we also compared ourselves with some uh, random configurations where the uh, where the allocation was done more or less randomly. Something like uh, what humans could do manually, and we are still a few percent uh, few percent better. So it seems that our method really works. Now yet another picture uh, which compares the benefits of our method. Here we are uh, comparing ourselves not only not with just another method, but we are also trying to increase the hyper period of the schedule. So the question is if I can make the schedule a bit longer, uh, does it allow me to save some temperature, like trade the period for the final temperature? And the answer is, of course, yes. It can be seen in this graph. Uh, uh, this green line is this uh, utilization, lowest utilization schedule, which is like the worst case what you can have if, if you care about temperature. And uh, uh, orange and blue is our method. So you can see that our method is better. This is what we have seen on the first slide. But then if we extend the period, if we make the schedule a bit longer, we can make this uh, schedule longer by two ways. Uh, either by just rescaling this initial schedule that we had, just make it a bit longer. And the temperature, of course, decreases because at some time uh, the whole CPU does nothing because everything is already computed. So the temperature goes down. But as you can see, if you apply our method uh, in full, if you run full optimization, and the results you can see in these figures in the left, basically what the method tries to do, it tries to move as much as workload from the high performance CPU to the lower, uh, to the energy efficient CPUs. So here at the bottom, almost nothing runs on the high performance CPU. And you can clearly see that there is a D at the end, there is a huge benefit. So to summarize it with few numbers, even if you extend the period by 21%, uh, if you, you can save the 11% of temperature, 
If you just compare this uh, orange and blue, you can already save 3% of temperature or reduce the temperature by 3%. If you can make the schedule even longer, you can uh, you can uh, reduce the temperature even more. And if you compare the temperature with respect to idle board temperature, not with ambient temperature, the percentage is, of course, uh, much higher. So that's uh, that's more or less uh, what I wanted to show today. Uh, in summary, this is like the whole thing that we have developed in, in this project. So we have the hardware, we have a lot of software tools that allow, allow us to get data from thermal camera, measure power consumption and so on. We can process the results and we input the results from those benchmarks to our scheduling method, which produces the schedule. And when this, this schedule is executed, we, in the avionics operating system, it, it decreases it decreases the final temperature. So uh, that was all in a nutshell. If you are interested in more details, uh, you can find you can find the details in the paper that we have published last year, which received uh, best paper award at RTCSA uh, conference. If you are interested in doing something similar, maybe our tools might be handy for you. Those are all open source available at here. And last but not least, if there is somebody from industry uh, is interested in doing something similar, uh, usually what we do is some kind of optimization combined with embedded systems. We are open to collaboration. You, there are different ways how companies can collaborate with us. Uh, both have the advantages, disadvantages. If you think it might be a good idea to collaborate, feel free to contact me and we can discuss the best way. That's all from me. Thank you for your attention.